Welcome to I'm Spiritual But, starring the award-winning author and actress Anne Scotland and globally renowned speaker and award-winning author Dr. Roger Leslie. I'm Spiritual But is a -a one-of-a-kind talk show about inclusive spirituality for religious and non-religious people alike. It's our vision to inspire everyone to discover their own unique spiritual experience. Email us at hello at imspiritualbutt.com. We'd love to hear from you or if you have a guest to recommend for the show. Thank you to USA Global TV, to our sponsors, and to all of you for spreading the word. And now, Anne Scotland and Dr. Roger Leslie. Hello, and welcome back to I'm Spiritual But. Hello, Roger. Hey, Anne, how are you this week? I am great. So good to see you. And thank you, all of you who are watching live or tuning in. This is a show for you about you. This is a conversation, a new global conversation about inclusive spirituality, and we'd love you to be a part of it. So please know that you can, during the live show, you can send us messages, comments, questions, and uh, we will check those throughout and respond to all the ones we possibly can. So please, um, we would love to hear from you. And also please do like and subscribe. Uh, That really helps us spread the word. Or if you know someone who needs some encouragement in their spirituality this week, um, share the show. So Roger, um, what are your opening thoughts this morning? So I'm not going to share the quotation yet, but our guest's quotation really did remind me how important our interconnection with other people is in our spiritual journey and in any endeavor. The people we know, the people we encounter, they make the biggest difference on how well we succeed, how much we feel loved, how much we feel like we can contribute to the world. And so I just want to acknowledge just people in general and the people that we have encountered in our lives and in our careers who have made the difference because without them, we would not be where we are right now. How about you, Anne? Absolutely. That is so true. Um, Being grateful and understanding that value, not only that we share others, but that we receive, you know, it's a catch 22 because sometimes we're so focused on giving that we forget to receive and other times we become self-focused and only receive and forget to give. So <laughs> I think it's, it's, this is a great conversation we're going to have about um, others and how we all need each other, which is really a huge part of this show is finding our commonalities and focusing on our personal and spiritual commonalities instead of our differences, instead of making us more separate and more alone. It's bringing us together. And, and that reminds me of the purpose of this show, which is to reflect the light of every viewer so that they live their dreams more fully and trust their own spiritual path more profoundly. I love that so much and really embodies why we're here um, to create a new global conversation. And we're excited for you all to be here. Uh, Roger, would you like to introduce our amazing guest today? It is a great honor for me to introduce our guest. So Reverend Kathy Hawison has a background in public relations and she has, she earned a master of divinity and has, and was an active minister since 1985. Well, before that, when she was in still in school, she started writing and she even got some works published while she was a senior in school. She's written many articles and many other types of works, and she has several books out in multiple genres, including spiritual books such as God in Raging Waters, A Ready Hope, Effective Disaster Ministry for Congregations, and most fascinating to me about Kathy is that she is a descendant of some of the original travelers on the Mayflower, and the book that I am most familiar with of Kathy's is one that I had the privilege of coaching her through and then serving as the editor for her more, most recent book, which is Mayflower Chronicles, The Tale of Two Cultures. Would you please welcome our wonderful guest, Reverend Kathy Hawison. Good morning. And it's just a joy to be here. I'm so grateful to you, Roger, for making this happen and Anne for getting a chance to meet you. I'm looking forward to the conversation this morning. 
Well, thanks, Kathy. We're so happy to have you here. Um, and I'm so excited about your book and that little bit of history that I was just learning about just now, um, Two Cultures. And isn't that true, no matter what time and place we are? So I can't wait to hear more about that. But before we get um, fully into our conversation, I love, Kathy, could you share a little bit about your spiritual life story, how it's brought you to where you are today? Um, I think it would be a Heinz 57 story. <laughs> I was not raised in the church. My grandmother was the primary um, focus in, in my religious upbringing, uh, although she never took me to church. But when she was much older and couldn't drive anymore, I would take her sometimes. Oh. Uh, my mother was a perpetual seat jerk, and we moved a lot. So over the course of my childhood, I was exposed to United Church of Christ, Presbyterian, Unitarian, uh, Methodist, and eventually landed in the Lutheran camp. But I had many questions, but I didn't know where to go to ask them or where to find the answers. Uh, but I remember the summer of my first uh, summer after high school, my very best friend started college that summer, and I wasn't going to start till the fall. The job that I had lined up for the summer fell through, so my summer consisted of a lot of reading and pondering and wondering what the future is going to bring. And I remember sitting on the steps overlooking Lake Erie. I grew up in Cleveland along the lake, and just staring out at all that vastness and thinking, this cannot be by accident. There has to be some force that brought all this into being. Someday I'd like to know more about that. Well, you know, be careful what you pray for. That landed me in seminary many years later. But um, I was perpetually searching. And then when I got ma I married into the Lutheran tradition and uh, the family joked that his ancestors were probably standing there in Wittenberg handing the nails to Martin Luther to pound his 95 thesis into that <laughs> castle church door in Wittenberg. Um, and they had always just been Lutheran, so they weren't going through the pondering that I was. It was just who they were. Uh, so we got married and started into young adult life, and we had an associate pastor at our church, uh, and I kept bombarding him with questions. And he finally said one day, if you had ever gone through confirmation, you would already know all of this, <laughs> but you're too old for me to put in a confirmation class. So plan B, this was really wonderful. I don't think anybody else ever had this kind of confirmation experience. Every Friday night, he and his wife would come over and his wife, Mary Jo, and my husband would get our two little girls settled down and ready for bed while Mel was taking me through confirmation classes at the dining room table. And then we would share a block of cheese and a box of crackers and a bottle of wine. And so that's how I learned the confirmation catechism that most young adults are exposed to when they're 12 or 13. And then, I don't know, I just kept getting led down the trail deeper and deeper. I would volunteer for various things at the church and then I would be asked to do other things and I would be asked, asked to teach classes. And I thought, you, you've got the wrong person. I don't, <laughs> I don't have the background for this. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, we moved many times. And in one of those moves, um, the pastor of the church where I had been a volunteer gave me as a going away gift, a one volume commentary on the Bible. So I started looking through that and I thought, I would really like to understand more about all this, but I really don't. I need, I need a tutor of some kind. Well, another move, we ended up next one county over from a seminary program. And at that time, I wanted to earn a master's degree in pretty much anything because I wanted to teach creative writing at a community college. I'd already taught some adult continuing education, life, a lifelong learner program kinds of things. And I'd had very good feedback about that, and I really enjoyed it. So I thought, if I get a master's degree, I can teach at least as adjunct faculty at some community college. Well, my best option for getting a master's degree turned out to be a Lutheran seminary. Uh, so long story short, I asked if they would accept me. They said they would, and I started working on what in, in that day and time and place was called a Master of Theological Studies. So I'm thinking... Well, this is great. Two birds with one stone. I'm getting my master's and I'm learning some things that I've always wanted to study, but I've never really known where or how to do that. And I absolutely fell in love with the curriculum. Mm. And then another year, another move. And so I left the seminary after only one year 
and moved to Texas. I'm thinking, well, they, they've got schools in Texas. Surely I can finish this up. This is a very long story that I'm going to kind of cut short here. But I ended up re-enrolling in a seminary program with all kinds of people, some known to me and some virtually total strangers who were connected to people who knew me, who said, why don't you just become a pastor? Uh, and so eventually I just quit fighting all of the people who were suggesting that and got my Master of Divinity degree and became a pastor in 1985. Wow. Still writing along the way because it's still my first passion is writing. Amazing. That is so beautiful. And and how how did how were you drawn to the story of inclusiveness and two cultures? Well, I grew up knowing that my family is connected to the Mayflower story. My mother was a reference librarian. She spent her early retirement years uh, doing the really tedious genealogy work to document that back before the Internet. She was going out to a genealogy library in Cleveland. Uh, so I knew that, and I thought, you know, that's interesting, but, you know, what's for dinner? I didn't pay much attention, <laughs> but one of our daughters uh, went to Texas Lutheran University near San Antonio, because we lived in Texas at the time, and we started hearing this name Rudy Flores all the time, and and I, re I remember consciously thinking, uh, we have a decision to make. We either embrace Rudy or we lose our daughter. I've got 20 some years invested in this young lady. I'm not letting her out of my life. So that left us to embrace Rudy and his entire very large family that came with him. He's one of only two children, but his mother is one of four and his father is one of 12. And most of them are still in the Houston area. And you know they all have adult children who are married and have children and is a, is a very large community. Uh, and Rudy's father is large heritage of Native American. Uh, I, and I can never remember whether it's Adtechs or Mayan, but a very large percentage of one or the other of those. So as the girls, uh, as my grandchildren were approaching school age, I told my daughter, you, you need to research this. You need to document this. This is where scholarship money, uh, as she and her husband were still struggling to pay off their student loans. So she she asked a few questions and then she said, mom, they're, they're not going to talk about it. They just, you know, they just don't want to talk about it. I said, well, okay. But that got me thinking their experience growing up in America has surely been different than my experience growing up in America. I wonder what that's all about. And so I started doing more reading about and by uh, native authors, uh, going to museums, reading magazines, got a subscription to the Native American Indian uh, uh, magazine from the museum in New York and Washington. And uh, the story just kind of started haunting me, really. I, I made two or three attempts to write it, but it wasn't really going anywhere. Finally, I signed up for a writer's conference retreat event in Vermont Oh, those are always wonderful. Yeah, they were wonderful. I played around with it for a while, and then I put it away. And I'm, I was still an active pastor. I was a very busy person, and this was kind of a hobby on the side. But the director of that program in Vermont called me and must have been about 2018, maybe, and said, um, you need to finish this book because the 400th anniversary is coming, and this book needs to be out for it. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. 1620 minus 2020. Yeah, that'd be 400 years. So I went back to the program a couple of times, finished the book, got the contract to publish the book, worked with Dr. Roger Leslie to get the book done. It probably wouldn't be in print if it weren't for him um, nagging me about, I need some more chapters to read. Uh, so, And I do want to say, Kathy, in, in honor of what you've done, the detailed and meticulous research you do to make sure that all the, the information is accurate. And what was even more impressive is that you not only made sure that you had a really good balance of the Native American perspective and the settlers perspective, but you also included really rich details about the women's perspective and what they went through on the journey and once they got here. That balance among those three elements, the women, the, ma the male settlers, and the Native Americans makes such a rich and diverse history. And I know that was part of your, your process because we talked about it. It's like you wanted to offer to people who yeah. want real history a more full-bodied version of that not right, just right. The, the the very narrow traditional uh, history of it that many of us, at least in our generation, received when we you know studied American history. 
So how was that process of, uh, you know, did you meet anybody really interesting along the way? Because we're segueing into your quotation. So is there anybody <laughs> you want to identify one person that really made an impact on your research and what you learned about yourself, your family, the whole history? Well, there are many people, but two things. First of all, right before the book was published, I'd already hired what we call a sensitivity editor to review the parts that were specifically about the native part of the story. But I wanted somebody to review the whole book before it was published. And so I went on a national hunt for somebody who would do that. Now, remember we're in 2019, it's pre-pandemic, so that's a non-issue, but it's the 400th anniversary is coming up. And all of a sudden it's like America woke up and said, oh, there were people here before the Europeans showed up and some of them are still here. Maybe we should talk to them. So the few people who were available for doing little interviews on TV and radio and podcasts and things were swamped with attention and I wasn't getting anywhere. And my son-in-law said, Kathy, they're not going to talk to you. They don't trust you. I said, well, I can understand why they wouldn't given the, how we've treated them, but the half of my heritage is in English is German. And I, and pretty tenacious when I need to be. So I just kept asking. And I reached out to one of the gals from the Vermont event that I was at. Her name is Elizabeth Plain. She writes her own amazing book. She'd be a great guest on your show. I'll introduce you to her afterwards. Um, she, this is, this is a divine intervention, I am sure. She went to her next door neighbor app and said, I have a friend in Houston who's writing a story about the Mayflower and she needs a Native American, somebody to review the book before it's published. Does anybody know anybody? That turned up Tracy Brown, who is a direct descendant of the Native American leader who was the one who negotiated the treaty with the English in the spring of 1621. Everybody associates the Mayflower with Thanksgiving dinner and that's not wrong. But the more significant and, in my opinion, important event was the treaty in the spring of 1621, when the natives at that point could have easily just let the pilgrims starve to death because they were really in a bad place uh, wow. in terms of, of their supplies. And um, so I met Tracy and then Tracy introduced me to her father and her son. And I interviewed the three of them one evening via a, a Zoom kind of an interview thing. And then I asked them if they would review the manuscript and they agreed to. And then I waited with white knuckles because I was thinking, what, what ethically am I going to do if they come back and say, how dare you appropriate our story? We've had enough of this, please don't publish this book. And then I would be in a real ethical bind because I had sort of asked their permission. Mercifully, that's not what they said. They said, thank you for including us. And then I asked them if they would consider writing the foreword and they agreed to. That's and fantastic. Then, and then I get chills when I tell this part of it. Um, they invited me to come and meet their tribal council in Rhode Island in June of 2020. And I was planning on doing that. And then, of course, COVID came and nobody was going anywhere. Uh, so I did not get to meet them in person until a year later, 2021. I had a chance to be in the area and got to meet them. And here, here's my takeaway. <laughs> they were so gracious, even though... They ended up losing most of their sacred tribal lands. Um, they were forbidden to speak their own language. They were forbidden to use their own name for themselves. They were forbidden to uh, practice their uh, spiritual traditions openly. They went underground until really about 25 years ago. They passed on their history orally from generation to generation. Research is now showing that what they have told their, their own people happened, research is documenting, yes, this is what happened. Uh, so just to be that welcome in a community um, where you know, our ancestors certainly knew each other, and that treaty uh, was honored by their ancestors and our ancestors for about a generation. And then the original leaders died off. More and more and more people kept flooding into the area from England, um, and then things fell apart, and then we had King Philip's War. But uh, the senior member of that family, uh, his comment was, you know, we can't change the past. What happened, happened. But we can do a lot better going forward. And I think you're creating that for us. And then thanks to you and your research and your, your connection to these people, that's, that's making all the difference. So I thank you for that. And it, it reminds me of the quotation that you provided for our show today. And what I love about this, Kathy, is with past guests, we've had 
people quote from great spiritual books, ancient books. We've had them quote spiritual leaders and church people. We've had them quote people from literature, poets, and so forth. Your quote came, came directly from mom. Right. And right. your mom yeah. told you, be good to people on your way up. You may need them on the way down. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that quotation and how that impacted your life, your life's journey. Well, my mother was a very pragmatic woman. She moved many more times than I had to. Uh, they were in 14 different addresses uh, in the first 11 years they were married. So she really had to be kind of self-contained uh, to start over again with three kids and, and a husband gone a lot. He was a civil engineer and he was often on international projects. So uh, she was really quite the woman. I was very fortunate to be raised by her. But her philosophy was you just never know how life is going to come back around on you. And that has happened to me several times. So, for example, I had to do an internship. That's part of how we make Lutheran pastors. I had to do a year long internship in Houston. And it was a rough year. I, it was just a lot going on and a commute. And I had at that time teenage daughters and life was very full. And then we finished the internship successfully. And I thought, well, that's that. Um, I probably will not stay in touch with my internship supervisor again, especially after we moved back to Ohio. And then years later, one March, I'm sitting at my desk at my uh, office at a church in Ohio, waiting for the Lenten services to start. And I get a call from my former internship supervisor. Hi, I know you have an interest in outdoor ministry. They need a program director at a camp down here in Texas. Oh, and by the way, it'll be about an hour away from where your daughter and at that point, two grandchildren wow. are. Uh, so may I put your name in for consideration? And that's beautiful. And, and he did. And, and I interviewed and, and that became a huge part of our family story. Uh, that camp has played a central part in not just my life, but um, my daughter's lives. All of us have worked there or volunteered there at some point in time over the past 20, 25, 30 years. That's wow. amazing. You know, and that, that reminds me, Kathy, too. You you will probably appreciate this as having been a teacher and Anne as a speaker and, and a, you know, a, glo a global impactor. You know, one of the things that profoundly impacted my life as a teacher was when somebody told me, you know, students may never remember a word of what you ta taught them, but they will never forget how you treated them. Yes, yes. Mm, yes. That's amazing. I love that so yeah. much. Yeah. I have a question for you, Kathy. I would love to know what you experienced um, in your research or what you learned or what you uh, was impressed, impressed by um, when you were studying uh, Native American spiritual traditions. Well, the first thing that struck me that I was not taught in school is that the reason they could speak to each other was in 1614, earlier Europeans came over to trade and took back with them 27 young Native American men to sell into slavery. And one of those young men that was sold into slavery uh, was, his name is Tisquantum, history knows him as Squanto. He, he had his freedom bought by Catholic friars, which I think is really ironic because the pilgrims were trying to get away from the Catholic Church and the established Church of England. But... Um, his quantum had his uh, freedom bought by Catholic friars. We do not know how he got from Spain to England, but we know that he did. He lived with a merchant family in London for a period of time where he learned excellent English. And then when he had a chance to return home, he did and found out that his village was deserted because another thing that I had not known in school, I have learned recently since um, in the past 10 years or so, I guess I've known that the diseases that the Europeans introduced were just devastating to the natives. They had no immunization against them. And so Tisquantum came home to find his village completely deserted, at which point he attached himself to the grand leader of the natives. His name is Massacoit, um, Massasoit Usamequin. He assigned himself to him as sort of a translator uh, because he could speak English and, and Massasoit could not, but he, all these English people were showing up. Uh, so he was in place to be the translator, which is how they were able to negotiate that treaty. Another thing that really struck me uh, in my research was how uh, well organized, at least the Native community that I researched. Now, that's one of the challenges. We want them lump them all together as Native Americans. There are 500 different Native nations uh, on this continent uh, before the Europeans showed up. And they all had their own very unique cultures and 
they shared some common languages, but they had multiple languages. They all had some kind of spiritual practices, but they varied from nation to nation. Uh, they had similar forms of housing, but they were unique to, to depending on what part of the country that they were in, because obviously South West area is very different than Northeast area. Um, and they were very well organized. Uh, so the women typically were in charge of things that give life, including obviously giving birth to babies, but get food uh, and preparing the food and preparing the home and, and maintaining the home and all of that. And the men were more in charge of things that actually took life. So that would be hunting, felling trees, that sort of thing. But it was very cohesive. Uh, so when the English showed up, wanting to barter for land, the natives said, you have to go talk to the women. They're in charge of that. And the English did not have that understanding of how men and women related to each other. So they kept trying to negotiate land deals with the men and the men kept saying, no, you need to go talk to the women. <laughs> so, I love that. I love that. Yeah. And, and Kathy, because the focus of our show is about spiritual growth and spiritual journeys, was there anything that you learned from the Native American uh, research that you did that expanded or broadened your spiritual understanding for your own journey? Well, I think just the, the I, there is a higher power, whatever name you want to give that entity in the world. Uh, there is such a thing. Uh, almost every culture has some creation story. Almost every culture has some way of communicating uh, with a higher power. Uh, and I, th I think rather than be suspicious of different people's ways of doing that, we ought to just be curious uh, and, and ask questions politely and not, not invasively because, you know, what is sacred is sacred and personal and, and sometimes not private, but sometimes very deeply personal. So mm -hmm. we have to have a lot of respect. I, I think coming with an attitude of I'd like to know more and then be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. I really uh, love that. And I love yeah. what you said about um, <clears throat> the sacred being personal, because I think anyone who's grown up, which some of our listeners have and some haven't in a religious environment, we, we were taught, you know, what sacredness meant. And it was um, something higher and above us that we didn't really have, feel like I never felt like I had a part in it. I'll speak for myself. Uh -huh. um, but I love this, um, the idea of each person, each culture and each person's spiritual experience is a sacred experience because it is unique to them, regardless of, you know, their tradition that they either love or that they're no longer in. However, that is, is still sacred because the divine, the higher self, whatever you want to call that is is in touch with each individual person. And this is what we often as a culture or a society forget and, and we, we judge each other so harshly because, oh, you believe a little bit differently than I believe, as opposed to your journey is sacred. How can I support you in your journey? So I won't go on on that because we have some comments to read, but I did want to um, say how much I appreciate that. Uh, we have a few comments. I think we have one from Heather. Heather says, I love this quote. <laughs> That's your quote, uh, Kathy. It's, it sort of reminds me of the golden rule. We should always just treat people with kindness and respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mm -hmm. love that. And another comment as well. I also love where the quote came from. My mother, too, always had little pearls of wisdom and shared them with me growing up. I love that. Um, so many things that we pass along to each other. And as Roger and I were talking right before the show, how much we all interdepend on each other. Um, we're, we're used to that in some ways, professionally, socially, even emotionally, but sometimes we forget that we have the opportunity to cooperate and support each other uh, spiritually as well. And I just want to say, because um, briefly, um, for anyone who's watching, uh, thank you, Heather, for those comments. Anyone else, please feel free to uh, add your comments or questions for any of us here uh, on the show today. And um, we'll have a chance to give you a little more information about the show in a few minutes. So Roger, I was turn it over to you. Kathy, I'm wondering if there are viewers who would like to learn more about some of these Native American spiritual practices that you studied or, and you researched for the book, are there resources that you can mention, either books that you read or websites that you visited that might be a good starting point? So if we're curious to know, you know, what do people know and 
What did they have back then? Where, where do we begin looking beyond this conversation? I would start with the two museums, one's in New York and one's in um, Washington, D.C., National Museum of the American Indian. They have websites. Uh, they are a wealth of information and they cover many different native nations. Uh, but you'll find names there and then you could reach out through those names. Almost every nation has some kind of their own uh, communication system, a website of some kind or a podcast or something. Uh, so if you show up legitimately wanting to know more, uh, people will direct you to where you can get more. There are Native Americans who are writing prolifically today. Uh, I would I don't have any names off the top of my head, but if you would just do a Google search for Native American authors, I think you would be amazed at how many authors there are out there. I wanted to switch gears for just a second, if you'll allow me. I, I have Turkey very much in my mind this morning with the devastating earthquakes. And you referenced an earlier book of mine, A Ready Hope. I just want to put a plug in that every major religious organization you can think of probably has a disaster response entity connected to it. And they are probably already organizing for how they're going to get help over to uh, Turkey. Uh, some of them focus specifically on domestic disasters, and we seem to have no shortage of those, but some of them do international. And that is where the faith community really comes together to bring physical help, clearing out the rubble, uh, delivering food and, and aid, but also spiritual help. They're the ones who show up and, and just have chaplains who just will sit and listen and let people just pour out all of that grief. Uh, so um, if, if you, like me, are wondering what to do, well, a good thing to do is go look up the uh, National VOAD, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, uh, no VAD, uh, and pick one that uh, aligns with your particular persuasion and, and point of view about faith matters, because um, we're not helpless. Um, they're organized, they, and they, they all take a little niche uh, one specializes in finding storage units for supplies that are going to be needed in the future. And one specializes in providing case managers to help families recover. And one specializes in uh, mucking out buildings and then rebuilding the buildings. Uh, it's a very well organized uh, part of the faith community, inter international, international and multi-denominational. And most people don't know enough about it. And with this organization, do these different denominations and faith disciplines work together to plan who's going to provide what? They do. They are very well organized. Wow. Yes, they have conferences every year. They have regional conferences. They have staff that communicate with each other. They do. Yes. That's great to hear. Yeah. 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 Anne? Oh, no, I was just thinking about uh, Turkey and Syria and um, and all that is going on there. And you know, the, the opportunity to bring people hope and help and even in their own faith tradition, depending on the area and, you know, the different faiths represented throughout, but, you know, even in their own faith tradition. So they have the ability to um, talk to their imam or their people of their faith and get the kind of support they need emotionally. Yes. Because yes. we all, when we go through this kind of disasters, you know, we think of New Orleans or many other things, 9-11, yes. even in this country, right? Um, how much it, it, may, it shakes us to our roots many times, especially if we lose people that we love, especially if we've lost our home, our jobs. And um, such an opportunity for, as you say, and I'm so glad you reminded us of this, Kathy, a global effort, again, to focus on our commonalities, to bring people what they can, what can be really helpful to them mm -hmm. and um, bring them companionship, comfort, support, and just knowing you're not alone, which is a big part of this show in general is letting everyone know they're not alone in their spiritual journey. Right. While we each have our own unique spiritual journey, you have people who support you just where you are, whatever stage you are, whatever step you are, you know, myself personally, I've been all over the map and back. So, <laughs> you know, and all along the way, there were people who helped me and encouraged me. And, and those were the people I never forgot when we talk about supporting one another, people who loved me as I was and how I said, how can I help you? How can I support you? What do you need? Um, as opposed to here, let me give you one particular way of fixing 
things. <laughs> and uh, so I was always super appreciative of that. So yes, thank you for bringing up Syria and Turkey. I appreciate that. Do we have time for one short disaster story? I think so. Okay. Uh, so I was a little bit involved with disaster response over in New Orleans after Katrina. That's another long story how I got into that, but I did. And so that I learned that um, there was a man who uh, had left because of, of the flood, but he came back and a friend from work said, you shouldn't have to go look at your house by yourself. I'm going with you. And that man had, had left the church years ago and never looked back. But they got to the man's house and the mud had blocked the doors open. So there was no way to get in through the doors. They walked around the house and they found a little window that was not locked. So they crawled in through the window. And while the man is just standing there, basically in a state of shock about the condition of what had been his home, his friend picked up a little piece of metal sticking up out of the mud and pulled it off and wiped it out. And there was that quote about when God closes a door, he opens a window. And the, mm. the friend said, I think I'm going to reconsider my uh, assumptions about things. Could I go to <laughs> church with you next Sunday? <laughs> I love that. I love that. And speaking of quotations, even this story about the disasters reminds me of the quotation you provided today, Kathy, because, you know, when I think of, you know, be, be good to people on your way up, you may need them on the way down. I usually think of that in terms of success, like, you know, things that I'm working toward, people have helped me, and there are always ups and downs. But I think of how many times in my own life when I've just needed support, you know, I, I've, yeah. you know, I've lost a house to a tornado while I was in it. You know, oh I, I've been, I've been in several disasters and it is such a helpless feeling. And on the flip side of that, how lucky we are to realize when we have the ability to help somebody else, when we're in a position to do that, what a fortunate experience for us mm -hmm. to think, what can I do? I have the physical ability to do that now and then take that inspiration to action and help because somewhere down the line, there's going to be a time when you are going to be so grateful that somebody responded to their own inspiration to help you because we're all going to need it multiple times throughout our lives. So and thank you for bringing that up. It, it is the simplest things. Uh, when I had had major surgery and I was stuck at home for six weeks and I was going to miss a major 40th birthday party. Back in the day, all of my social activities were 40th birthday parties. Now they're 80th birthday parties. But <laughs> anyway, um, one friend videotaped some of the highlights of the party with the guest opening the gifts and stuff and brought it over for me. Back in the days when things were done with VHS uh, format. I mean, today it'd be a phone, but this was a long time ago. Uh, but just a simple little thoughtful act. And it meant the world to me to kind of be included from, from afar. And yeah. that just goes to show you there's no task or thoughtful gesture too simple to do. You know, we right. may dismiss it as saying, oh, well, you know, that's really not doing much. From our perspective, it may not seem like it takes much effort. It may make all the difference in that person's day, in their heart, in their spiritual journey. Those little blessings that we offer to others that may seem very insignificant when we do them can be the, the entire turning point for another human being. So right, when we get right. those inspirations, let's act on them. It's just right. such a blessing that we get to do that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are down to our last couple of minutes here. And so before we go, I just want to remind all our viewers and listeners, thank you again for joining today. And stay tuned as well for next week. We have another uh, great guest talking about some, some new things that we haven't really discussed yet on the show. So excited for that. And please like and subscribe uh, to the show. Share the show to those who think might need it. We appreciate it. And we're here for you. You can also email us any of your questions or comments. You can go to our website, imspiritualbutt.com, and um, you can contact us there. You can also recommend uh, a guest for the show, or if you are someone who is a representative of inclusive spirituality in your journey and you might be interested in being on the show, you can also send us a message there. So I just want to say thank you so much, Kathy, for being here. It's been wonderful. Oh, it's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Kathy, you've got, you have great stories. Thank you so much. And thank you for enlightening me personally about so much of the history of this country and the diversity that created what we built and where we are. 
Uh, we have so much, we owe so much to the people who were here before the settlers arrived. And you, you're reminding me of that just gives me a deeper appreciation of how interconnected we all are. Thank you for that. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank you all for watching. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.